Live from Government House, a big day in politics. Premier Dwight Ball decides to bring in some new faces in his cabinet and change his team. Of course, he's getting ready for an election in 2019. Stay tuned. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, I'll tell you, the autumn sitting of the House of Assembly has brought many surprises, some bad ones, and now this, a cabinet shuffle. There had been rumors. Those rumors were made real today. I spent most of the day at the House of Assembly with my colleague, Katie Breen. And Katie, we certainly weren't expecting all of a sudden 3.30 island time. You got to get to Government House because the Premier's making some changes. That's right. A lot of them weren't expecting this. It's a big change. Three brand new cabinet ministers who have never had their own portfolios all today. First up, we had Carol Ann Haley from the Buren Peninsula. Buren Grand Bank is her district. She now has the status of women. Now, Siobhan Cody used to have that portfolio. She had that along with natural resources. But today, the Premier said, we're going to break that away. Status of women, it's going to be its own thing. And Caroline Haley is going to be the minister. Next up, Graham Leto. He became the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Graham Leto is from Lab West. He actually used to be the president of municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador and was a former mayor in his region, so some credentials there. And that is Eddie Joyce's old job. Third, Bernard Davis. He is the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills and Labor. He actually used to be a, a councillor with the city of St. John's and now he, he's also a first time minister. And then, of course, we've got some ministers who were affected by this as well because they lost little slices of what they used to have. So let's go over those details. That's right, because Bernard Davis, his uh, portfolio, Advanced Education Skills, that used to belong to Al Hawkins. Now Al Hawkins is early uh, childhood education. That used to belong to uh, Dale Kirby. Right. Fifth, we have... And he keeps education as well, which is important. He took over education, uh, and now he holds that as well. He, he loses the higher end of the education system, if you will. That's right. And fifth, finally, Siobhan Cody, natural resources. Like we said, she already had that portfolio, but uh, now she no longer has status of women, just natural resources. All right. And, of course, uh, a lot of stuff happening here today, including, of course, that the Premier addressed that issue that Katie just mentioned, the status of women added a new portfolio I think was as important to me which is a priority and I've got to thank Minister Cody for the work that she's been doing and in uh, the role that she's been doing with the committee on the consultations that's, that's been happening across the province in women in leadership so what I didn't want to do was find the work of this these consultations come back with the framework I also wanted to make sure that we had a process in place with the minister attached to it that would put the priority on increasing the pre presence of women in leadership roles in this government. So now we put a dedicated department, a minister to it, that will just not just look at this framework, but it will also be part of the implementation of that framework. All right, so big changes, new faces, and now political observers are trying to figure out what all this means. All right, Katie Breen, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Of course. Busy day that uh, Katie and I weren't expecting. Now, Katie mentioned political observers. Well, let's think about some of the meaning of this change. For one thing, it means that Dale Kirby and Eddie Joyce, the moat around the House of Assembly, they are sealed off. They clearly aren't coming back into uh, Dwight Ball's cabinet. They will stay on the opposite side. A clear message, you're not welcome back. That's it. Chapter closed. And that's really what has caused all of this. Two key cabinet ministers, including a personal friend of the Premier, ejected over bullying and harassment. The Premier couldn't make this change until all of that ugly venom was dealt with, with the Commissioner of Legislative Standards and all the debates that we had. So what's interesting is in replacing those two, he has also taken advantage of it politically as an opportunity to bring in three new faces. And that will get people thinking, all right, what does this new team look like? What are the skills? What are the talents? And is this enough to send a message to his caucus? that he's got discipline of the party once again. A lot of people in back rooms not happy with what has happened over the last few weeks. You've had Eddie Joyce saying, I can't work with Gambin Walsh, Gambin Walsh saying, I can work with him, really unsightly scenes. And so what the Premier has done today, or what he hopes to have achieved today, is to actually get his team back together, get it back on track. He's getting on a plane to China in a couple of hours. He'll be gone until next week, comes back, hopes these ministers get their act together. And he says, as he said this week earlier, they're talking again in Liberal caucus. Maybe these are the steps that he needs to really get the government back under control and impose some discipline, which I think every observer admits has been lacking. Debbie? 
Thank you so much, Anthony. You are there at uh, Government House, but I understand you're headed back here and you'll join me here on the desk just as soon as you make your way back. Turning now to other news, victims of domestic violence will soon have the option of taking time off work to deal with their personal life. Today, government announced it will be introducing family violence leave legislation. It will allow people affected by domestic violence to take a mixture of paid and unpaid leave. Here now is Carolyn Stokes joins us live with more. Carolyn, how will this work? Well, Debbie, if a person affected by domestic violence needs to get out of their house to a shelter or needs to seek medical care or legal advice or find a new place to live, the law will entitle them to time off work, just like bereavement leave, for example. Except family violence leave includes a total of 10 days annually. Now, three of those days are paid, seven are unpaid. So what constitutes domestic violence? Minister Al Hawkins says this legislation covers not just physical abuse. It can also involve situations that are emotional or psychological, and it extends to the employee's family members. So if their child is struggling through some kind of domestic violence, the parent can take time off. When that person goes through this uh, situation, they don't need any more added stress. They don't, have, they don't need to have the worry about how am I going to deal with my employer? How am I going to deal with uh, working over the next couple of days? How am I going to address these? They don't need any of this. They, they have an immediate need. So it will make a huge difference. Not everyone will come forward. We had that conversation as well. But for people who uh, will come forward and who need to take that time uh, to put things in order, then uh, it's, it's life-saving, really. Now, Carolyn, does government know how many people are expected to use this leave? Well, Debbie, it's kind of difficult to say because not many people in this province report domestic violence. So one question is, would a victim be comfortable revealing that deeply personal trauma to their employer? Now, the statistics show the majority of domestic violence in this province is hidden. In 2016, only around 10% of incidents were reported. And that same year, 1,250 one complaints were made to police and this part you may find surprising of that total 505 came from men it sort of uh, hit me as as uh, you know a bit of a surprise as well uh, but I guess you know uh, domestic family violence can come in any form and and really I don't think it's it needs to be gender attached and uh, so I guess, you know, part of that, uh, uh, what we're looking at today is make sure that the me we have the measures in place to address whether, no matter what gender. Now, many people are familiar with Iris Kirby House. It's a women's shelter. They know how big the need really is. The shelter gets 20,000 phone calls from people in distress every year. It's certainly a start. It's a beginning step, as the minister said. I mean, everything, we'd like it to be, uh, you know, more robust, but you have to start somewhere. And one of the reasons Michelle Green supports this move is because she knows firsthand of women losing their jobs when their lives have become disrupted by domestic violence. Now, this new legislation is expected to take effect January 1st. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. I'm Gare Ferry here in Grand Falls, Windsor, where the St. John's Edge have taken their training camp outside the Avalon for the first time. The game's going on right in there. I'll have that story coming up on here now. Well, busy uh, first part of our newscast tonight, so we'll uh, take a little bit of a respite with the weather. I hope it's going to be a respite. How are things looking, Ashley? Yeah, it didn't feel like that today, though. Quite windy for the Avalon mm -hmm. and parts of Buren this afternoon. Uh, the winds will eventually ease tomorrow. Uh, not that much, but uh, it does look like a windy weekend uh, as we head towards the next 24 hours. At least we're going to see that chance of flurries for Labrador continue into the afternoon tomorrow. Scattered showers or flurries for parts of uh, the island as well. And another weekend, which means another storm is on the way. Uh, it does look like it will transition from snow through to freezing rain and then rain for parts of the island. And then this should just be a snow event for parts of Labrador. But those winds are going to pick up and it's going to stay windy. It looks like right into next week. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up in a little bit. 
Thanks, Ashley. Well, some East Link customers in Happy Valley Goose Bay were dismayed this week when they turned on their TV and there was nothing there. The company is making upgrades to its service, but the lineups that's causing, that that is causing is turning some people off. Here now's Jacob Barker has that story. This is supposed to be a good news story for East Link. It says it invested $2 million here to make the internet faster and improve the cable service as well. What customers here weren't happy with was coming home and finding all their TV channels were poof, gone. No, last night when I went home, I never had no TV. I went to watch the hockey game okay. and I never had no TV. East Link has set up shop at the Masonic Lodge here in town. Some tell us they've had to wait anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to get their new television receivers. Nobody told me about it. They could have let people know. They switched it over without warning as far as I'm concerned to anyone and no one had their boxes. So everybody's up here now trying to get their boxes. Many were aware that changes were on the way, but some were under the impression they would be getting their new box in the mail. Others thought a technician would show up to have it installed. I have received a letter in the mail to say that I would receive my boxes, but on the uh, Facebook page I <laughs> realized that, uh, oh no, some people are not getting their boxes, so we better come up here and, and, uh, and check it out, so I did. There were those that heard about the new offerings Eastlink has on the go, and they came down to check it out, but were turned away by the lineups. The deal seems really good, but uh, there's quite a, quite a wait in there right now. <laughs> and though the disruption and the wait were annoyances, some left happy with what they were getting. There is a pretty awesome deal that allows me to get rid of Bill and um, have just Eastlink for TV and internet, and I don't have to pay for a home phone that nobody uses. Eastlink says that those upgrades happened on Tuesday night, and it was only a small number of customers that didn't have their new receivers mailed to them or hand-delivered before that upgrade happened. They do, though, recognize that it has been frustrating for the customers, and they say that they're doing everything they can to get the equipment into the hands of those who need it. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. A museum in Mount Pearl is launching a brand new exhibit tonight, featuring a number of never before seen artifacts. The Admiralty House Communications Museum is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War and sharing stories of the Newfoundland Royal Navy Reserve. Here now is Jeremy Eden, has been checking in on the exhibit and joins us now live. Jeremy, what will happen tonight? Well, right now we're in the exhibit, but it's not officially open. It doesn't open until 7 p.m. this evening, and there'll be a lot of people stopping by to see exactly what the Armistice House has on display. But earlier today, I got a little bit of a sneak peek. Now, almost all of these artifacts, with the exception of one, belong to a private collection. Many of these items have never been seen by the general public before, and it took a very big event to get them out of the private collector's house and into glass cases. Now, one of the people who has worked hard to put it all together is the museum's manager, Sarah Wade. It's an idea that we've had uh, for a couple of months now. Um, things really got serious in August, trying to pull everything together. And, uh, but it's been a very busy few weeks for our very small museum and are uh, very grateful that for all of our volunteers uh, that kind of came together to really put this up and get this on display within the past two weeks. So that was just a, a sneak peek of what I saw earlier today of the uh, Armistice 100 exhibition here at Admiralty House in Mount Pearl. But Sarah and I did a longer tour, and I'll have that tape coming up later on in the show. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Mount Pearl. Well, a little bit of a wet night expected. Just a few showers and then partly clearing skies through the night tonight. But I will have your full forecast coming up after the break.
The RNC has just issued a news release saying it is investigating a suspicious death in St. John's. Police responded to an apartment on Bay Bulls Road around 10.30 last night after a woman had died. The RNC said a 45-year-old woman was pronounced dead by paramedics, and her death is believed to be suspicious. The chief medical examiner will conduct an autopsy to determine the cause of death. Well, the St. John's Edge are finishing off their first training camp outside the Avalon. It's coming to a head tonight with an exhibition game, but there's been lots of learning off the court, too. Here and now's Garrett Barry was live tonight in Grand Falls, Windsor. We've had a bit of a technical problem, though, so here's what we do know. There are more than 400 people in attendance. The Edge say they're planning to treat this game like any other, and they are doing the full pre-game routine. As well, tickets sold out fast tonight in just 30 minutes. Hometown star Carl English says it's part of an effort to get the province familiar with the Edge and get the Edge familiar with Newfoundland. The name is St. John's Edge because that's the city where the team and, and stuff is, but I, I look at us as Newfoundland's team. I mean, that's one of the main goals of myself personally when I came back home was to spread basketball all through the province of Newfoundland. On the road and back to basics. This is perfect, perfect situation, and this describes Newfoundland. Like, we were in the river. We go out and ice our legs in the river. I mean, that's, that's just perfect. I do that every summer with, you know, I'll come from practice, I'll go down and get in the ocean. So, you know, that, that's just part of who we are, and I wanted to show them what we, you know, where we're from. Here at the Riverfront Chalets, a bit of a change of scenery for players from America and India. There are some sites on the checklist. Everybody wants to see a moose. <laughs> you know, I, I took the I took the coaches hunting a couple of weeks ago and we didn't get to get either one, but on the way back there was one on the road and they were amazed. So all the guys, that's all they talk about. They're like, I don't want it to be too close. Like some of the guys don't even want to leave their windows open. So it's it's a little bit funny. You know, there's places where they come and things that they've seen and then they're scared of our wildlife. So it's uh it's a little bit different but it's fun in the same sense. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. <laughs> Very enthusiastic <laughs> students. Uh, that's Donna Williams, grade five class from St. Andrews Elementary. And they were here for a visit early this morning. And uh, as I said, quite enthusiastic. I understand that they uh, really got a kick, Ashley, out of the green screen. Oh, yes. It's, there they are. It's always a hit. <laughs> Definitely always a hit. Oh, that's your weather picture from last it night. It is from last night, yeah. And they've got those magic green cloaks on. Kids are disappearing into Bonavista. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thanks for the visit. Yeah, hmm. I love it when the kids come. Yeah, me too. It's so nice. So, what are, you were saying wind, wind, wind. Yeah, we saw pretty windy conditions across most of the island today. If we take a look at the numbers, we hit uh, 78 here in St. John, 78 kilometer per hour gusts. Uh, and then similar across uh, the Buren as well, around 81 for Winterland today. Now, uh, winds are still quite strong along the coast as well. We're seeing gusts upwards of about 60, uh, even 70 kilometers per hour. And it does look like it'll stay pretty windy as we head through the day tomorrow as well. Uh, just a little less, probably gusts closer to about 50 or even 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, but uh, temperatures today around seasonal was quite nice, between 7 and 9 degrees for the island, 2 degrees in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Churchill Falls at minus 1. And temperatures have dipped a little bit down into the mid single digits five degrees in Corner Brook, six in St. John's. And then because of that wind, we are seeing a little bit of a wind chill. Those numbers uh, feeling closer to between zero and about three degrees in some cases. Uh, minus three, it feels like in St. Anthony. So uh, as we took a look at the current satellite and radar, we are seeing some showers pass through uh, the Avalon that will continue as we head through the night tonight and then some flurries as well along the West Coast. That is the case uh, over the next 24 hours, at least in more of a, a westerly flow. Uh, if we take a look at the future tracker, you can see that. And then in the higher elevations, that should be flurries and even towards inland areas as well. By the time the morning rolls around, 
parts of central could see that chance of uh, either showers or flurries in the morning. And then we're going to continue to hang on to that risk across uh, the coastal parts of Labrador as well through the day. Otherwise, it looks like a nice day. We could see uh, a mix of sun and cloud and then that chance of showers isolated in nature, uh, moving through most of the island, making its way towards the Avalon in the evening hours. Uh, but temperatures through the night tonight going to dip down uh, to about three degrees. It looks like for St. John's again, that risk of showers for most of the island clearing skies, though, uh, for the northern peninsula. Uh, St. Anthony should go down to a low near minus three through the overnight tonight. Clearing skies for the Straits as well, minus three. Cartwright looking at either rain or snow and one degree. And then for essentially McCovic northward through to Nain, uh, we're looking at either rain or drizzle or rather drizzle or flurries. And we could see some freezing drizzle with that as well as that temperature dips to about minus two. And then flurries for Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Lab City. Into tomorrow, we are looking at that mix of sun and cloud temperatures a little cooler than what we're seeing today about three degrees for Corner Brook, uh, four in Grand Falls, Windsor, seven in St. John's. And then we'll see those winds generally out of the west, gusting upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. Along the coast, those winds will ease, uh, but sh shifting to about southwest winds near 20 kilometers per hour. Plenty of sunshine for central Labrador and northern Labrador. And then again, that risk of flurries towards the coast and into Lab City as well. So as we head towards the weekend, it does look like we are uh, going to see a storm. I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. That was all in tech, more so, eh? And now just, you can see what it is now. Just ahead, the history of the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve and the HMS Calypso as we continue our coverage of the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War.
Well, these photos show just some of the men who served on the water in the Great War, but the stories of the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve aren't quite as well known as those told about the Trail of the Caribou. Newfoundland sailors manned many of the British Navy's warships, and all started out on one. It was called the Calypso. This is all there is. HMS Britain. Rotten. Rusty. Fading into the water as her history fades into another century. Yeah, it was a sad sight, isn't it? Malcolm Nippard's been watching it fade into the waves for years. Well, Ten years ago, that was all intact, more so, eh? And now it's, you can see what it is now, you know. Even in this state, there are hints that this was once a mighty ship. It was a big boat. Which, like I said, there's a lot of hers you, you can't see. It's in on the water. Before the Britain was this, a collapsing wreck on the shore at Embry, she was this, the Calypso, a late 1800s warship in the British Navy. Before she became part of Newfoundland's great war effort, the Calypso was a training ship on the other side of the Atlantic. In 1900, the ship sailed into St. John's Harbor. The Calypso would become home to the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve. My name is Lauren Lamb, and I'm the assistant curator at Admiralty House Communications Museum here in Mount Pearl. During the Great War, some of the men who trained on the Calypso served in this building. It was a secret wireless communications operation guarded by the Newfoundland Navy Reservists. Now, pieces of the ship they trained on are here at the Admiralty House Museum. Artifacts donated over the years somehow rescued from the Calypso before she became a shipwreck in Embry. Small pieces of a big piece of Newfoundland's war story on the water. The Calypso was really kind of perfect for the time that it existed in. Before the war broke out, um, men would just sign up for five years of service and what that would look like is just uh, every year they would have to go through 28 days of training and then uh, they would get naval pay, so it was really good for when the fishery was not open. Um, so before the war, they had about 375 men that would have trained aboard. But then, when the war broke out, uh, the, the ranks kind of just grew. And those men, over a thousand of them, served on the sea for the British Navy. Many saw action. Some never came home. Some of these men, they ended up in places like Turkey, you know, in the, in the Mediterranean, things like that. Um, th throughout the Royal Navy, the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserves, like they, they were lauded, like people knew that they were so good at what they did and they were so strong and reliable. They called them the best little boatmen in the world. They, they peppered all over the Royal Navy in the First World War. Midway through the war, the Calypso lost her original name. The British wanted it for another ship, so the Calypso was renamed the Britain in 1916. She stayed in St. John's, continuing to be the training ground for Newfoundland's wartime sailors. But after the war, they didn't really need it anymore. So um, they had kind of made modifications to it that would have made it impossible to kind of go back. And it was already not really seaworthy when it got here anyways. So uh, in 1922, the A.H. Murray Limited Company bought it. And once again, it wasn't used as really a sailing ship. It was used to store salt and coal for the city of St. John's. So it did that for a while. And then in the 1950s, they didn't need it anymore. So they towed it to Lewisport. In Lewisport, the Calypso was a floating storage for salt used in the fishery. That's where a young Malcolm Nippard became familiar with the big ship. Now I used to uh, drive a boat from Lewisport out to where that one was anchored out in the harbor. When the salt boat come in, I used to take the boat men back and forth for working on the boat, take the salt at the other boat and dump it into that one. Eh? In the late 1960s, the Calypso was no longer needed for anything. She was scuttled and burned. For a ship that didn't really go many places after 1900, it, uh, it definitely saw a lot of people and, and put a lot of people all around the world. It's a hundred years since the end of the Great War. What was once home to Newfoundland's Naval Reserve is home now to a hawk's nest. And a few years from now, the Calypso will slip all the way under the waves by Malcolm Nippard's Wharf and slip into history. 
I didn't know about that yeah. history at all. That was quite a history. A ship almost like a, a living thing for so many people. It's fantastic. It was indeed. Yeah. And as you can see, here and now's Jeremy Eaton is back with us, and he's live at Admiralty House in Mount Pearl, where a new exhibit is opening called Armistice 100. So, Jeremy, you're getting close to the big uh, kickoff, are you? Yeah, uh, we are. It doesn't actually open until 7. There's a few people here, but it doesn't actually open for another 28 minutes. And this is one of the many amazing artifacts that you'll find at this exhibition here at Admiralty House in Mount Pearl. And as I said, it's not really officially open yet, but earlier today I got a special tour with the museum's manager, Sarah Wade. We have shrapnel there that's been intact. We have German barbed wire. You can notice just how close uh, the wires are put together. All of these artifacts uh, on display are on loan from uh, one of our board members, a private collector, Dr. John Williams. Uh, there's only one item in here that actually belongs to Admiralty House's collection, and it's a HMS Calypso ammunition box. So this is a helmet that would have been worn uh, by the Germans in the First World War. The end of the First World War is really important for us to recognize, and, and I think it's something that you know we need to take a moment to respect and to uh, remember what happened, what sacrifices were made. And it's important to us because Admiralty House was once a top secret wireless station. It had been erected by the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Station in 1915, and it would stay that way until 1921. Uh, and it was the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reservists that guarded that station. They had trained them on the Calypso. And oftentimes you hear about what happened during First World War, and we kind of want to focus on, okay, so the armistice was signed uh, in uh, November 11th, 1918, and we want to know what happened after that. There's a local Mount Pearl artist, Darlene Redman. Uh, she had heard about Dr. John Williams' collection and her son was actually studying for a heritage project. And she was just in awe of everything that uh, he had on display. And so she started studying the items and she incorporated those into her paintings. So as you walk through and look at the five original paintings that we have, uh, you'll see the items that had inspired her paintings and what are included. So we have the mess tin, uh, a cup, a spoon, a fork, a shoulder badge, and all of those items that are on display, you'll find them in, uh, right in her paintings. You know, we're just so grateful to be able to have these items on display. And I think it's important that we just take a moment to look at these items. And, and it's just so sad that these material possessions were able to come home, but some men weren't. As you can see, John Pike has zoomed in on a couple of those artifacts. Now, I met John Williams today, and he doesn't really want to talk about his collection, but he is very proud of it. He told me that he found a lot of these items himself while searching the battlefields in Europe with a metal detector. Now, as I said, the uh, exhibit doesn't officially open until 7 p.m. They're going to have a number of workshops over the next couple of weeks, and it'll run here at Mount, in Mount Pearl until the 30th of November. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Admiralty House Communications Museum in Mount Pearl. October 21st, 1916. Dear Mrs. Moore, yesterday I went to see your son in hospital here. I must first tell you he is doing splendidly, and I would not be surprised to know he will be home in time to have his Christmas dinner with you. He has had a very hard time indeed. He asked me to write you and let you know how he fared. It is a most difficult letter for me to write as I am a poor letter writer at any time and therefore am not the least capable of conveying to you a description of anything like the wonderful courage your brave son has shown in the hospital. He has been wounded in both legs and the doctors, to save his life, found amputation necessary. He has the left leg amputated above the knee and also the right foot above the ankle. He stood the operation splendidly and is going to England today. The doctors, nurses, and Red Cross men cannot say too much of him. In asking them how he acted after the operation, their words to me were, he is one of the bravest men we have attended to in this hospital. They assured me all danger is over and now it is only a matter of time before he is well again. He told me he would write you immediately after he arrived in England, so therefore you can look forward to receiving a letter from him a day or two after receiving this. While expressing my sympathy to you, 
I must also express my deepest admiration for the marvelous courage your brave boy has shown. Yours sincerely, Herb Dooling, Newfoundland Regiment. We join Joe Gowdy on his annual paddle down Labrador's Churchill River, an archival special at a special time, Sunday at 2 and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now, everyone, and let's get back to provincial politics. Dwight Ball's cabinet has a very different look tonight. It certainly does. The Premier walked in the government house about two hours ago, along with various Liberal caucus members and some current members of cabinet, as well as some MHAs that he has now brought into his cabinet. And after the swearing in of three new faces and a couple of not-so-new faces, Ball spoke with reporters. It was now timely to uh, give me the opportunity to actually uh, just, as I said, absorb and reflect where we are. And today I'm very proud of the team that I have standing behind me and the new cabinet members that we have, you know, coming at the cabinet table. Well, you know, it's, uh, we've, you know, as I said yesterday, and I spoke about this, this is our caucus right now. This is our cabinet, the group that we will move forward with. Uh, very pleased to bring the experience that we have in filling those two roles today. It gives me the opportunity as the you know, Premier to put some fresh faces on our cabinet. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the team that we have going into 2019 and beyond. You mentioned um, that some of these uh, new folks were reformed around 2.30 today. Mm -hmm. When did you uh, decide <laughs> uh, I mentioned, I, I think I mentioned a few days ago that I would, I would be taking time to reflect. I've been taking a lot of mental notes and a lot of physical notes, too, I will say. And I've watched individuals, I've watched them respond, I've watched them react. And today we've picked a team uh, with the experience and some. Uh, we've added a new portfolio, I think, which is important to me, which is a priority. And I've got to thank Minister Cody for the work that she's been doing. And, in uh, the role that she's been doing with the committee on the consultations that's, that's been happening across the province in women in leadership. So what I didn't want to do was find the work of this, these consultations come back with a framework. I also wanted to make sure that we had a process in place with the minister attached to it that would put the priority 
on increasing the pre presence of women in leadership roles in this government. So now we put a dedicated department, administer to it, that will just not just look at this framework, but it will also be part of the implementation of that framework. Is that because something has sunk in over the recent level of toxicity dealing with the rest of the building that you decided now is the time to make it a discrete portfolio with one single minister? No, I think if you look at the actions and, and the vision that we had for the province, and even within the way forward, you would see that we wanted to bring a focus on women in leadership roles. It's one of the reasons why, you know, Siobhan Cody has been working on this for quite some time. So the, the consultations are now coming to a close and this will come back with a report which will have some recommendations in it. So in preparation for that, I wanted to make sure that we actually had a minister in place that will actually take those rep recommendations and put them into an implementation. So Cody's a talented minister, but she's pretty busy with natural resources. So why didn't you decide that the status of women was more important earlier than today? Well, Minister Cody is uh, definitely a, a very busy minister, but she's done a great job at this. So when the report comes back, there will be recommendations. And then, uh, you know, now Minister, Minister Haley will take those recommendations and create a, an action plan, implementation of those recommendations. This was a significant move today. Do you ex anticipate any further changes before the next election? You, you never know. Uh, you never know where this where this will go between now and 2019. Well, I, what I do know, this is a group that will lead us into 2019, and there's no reason to believe that these are not members of a cabinet, you know, leading into the election. So some big changes, Debbie, and uh, the premier sort of unleashes this change, and he's going to let's see what time it is. Yeah, he'll be getting on a plane to China, and he'll be gone for a while, so it gives him a chance to see how this new team is going to work, especially after the toxic nature of the house for the last little while. So we'll see That's if this. That's an understatement. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> is. So I think he's trying to get some order back. So yeah. we'll see what happens when uh, when the premier comes back. Yeah, and. Uh, as he said, there could be more changes. A year is a long oh, yeah. time in politics, as we know. He could go into the election campaign with this cabinet. Uh, or not. Or maybe not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So many thoughts and memories of the First World War this week, and when it comes to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, we know a lot about what happened during the First World War, but what about afterwards in the 20s and 30s and leading up to the Second World War? That's next.
Duke of Edinburgh Volunteer Hall of Fame Gala honors exceptional volunteers here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Join Fred Hutton and myself, Chrissy Holmes, on November the 15th for an evening of celebration and inspiration as we pay tribute to this year's newest inductees. For more information or to purchase tickets, you can always check out the website, volunteerhalloffame.ca. Welcome back once again, and we are going to throw things over to you in just a sec, but we've got some video or a picture. Tell yeah. us about it. <laughs> Look at this shot. This picture was taken by Carrie Harris. He snapped it outside the Fogo Island Health Center. It's caribou? It's caribou. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say, uh, that's the largest pack of dogs I've ever seen, but... <laughs> Wow. You think they're camped out for their flu shots, maybe? Oh. Wow. <laughs> this time of year, who knows? Wow, what a shot. It is lovely. I wonder how long they stuck around. I don't know, but I don't know what they're, yeah, I don't, maybe they do. Just they grazing. know we all need our flu shots, so. <laughs> <laughs> just grazing by the health center. Why yes, not? Yeah. Well, uh, this weekend, uh, you might want to be inside because uh, another storm is on the way. Uh, Environment Canada already has a number of uh, special weather statements in effect, and uh, it does look like things will be pretty messy, but um, into the day to on Sunday, or rather Saturday, we're going to see things clear out for the first half of the day thanks to a ridge of high pressure. So uh, into the morning hours, that does look like the nicest time. And then we'll see this cloud cover start to make its way further north, and that's that system that's going to move in. And this time, it looks like things will stay as snow. The models are picking up on that first. The Avalon looks like it should stay as rain in the first half of the day. Might see that chance of some showers before that moves through. But this transition, uh, it looks like it'll go through a freezing rain to rain for most of the island. And then those winds are really going to pick up. It will be a mainly snow event um, starting Saturday night into Sunday for Labrador. So those temperatures hovering around the single digits for the most part for most of the island. Two degrees in Gander. Again, that snow changing over to rain with that transition uh, through the evening hours. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay, zero degrees on Saturday. The Straits sitting at zero as well with that chance of flurry. So here's a look at that system on by Sunday morning. It's already moving towards Labrador. The winds won't really pick up until the afternoon in behind this system. So uh, it looks like if you are going to take uh, part in any of the activities for Remembrance Day, the afternoon should clear out, but then those winds pick up for the West Coast. That should stay as snow and most of Labrador as well. The system moves offshore and then those winds are going to stay quite strong in behind that on Monday morning. Again, on Tuesday, we're going to see another ridge of high pressure. Things will clear out and then another system moves in by the time midweek next week. This is the one where we could see that potential for the first significant snowfall for parts of the Avalon uh, into the afternoon. And then that system continues to track further east. And then in behind that, that those temperatures are going to significantly drop. We get more into an Arctic air mass, and then it does look like snow for uh, into Tuesday as well. So here's a look at the five day forecast. Uh, that push of warm air will move in for the Avalon, though it could reach 11 degrees by Sunday. Windy conditions again. Most of that shower activity will be in the first half of the day and then clearing in behind that on Monday and Tuesday, continuing to stay quite windy as well. Now for Western Newfoundland, not going to see that warm up only sitting in the single digits, but again, windy conditions expected by Tuesday night as we get into that cooler air. It does look like things will change back over to snow, not more of that mixture for central portions. Uh, we're looking at windy conditions again right through the island. There's that warm up though for uh, there and then into Labrador. That's when we're going to see that most of that snow could pick up about 10 to 20 centimeters for Western Labrador, Eastern Labrador more with 20 to 30 centimeters. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look at your weather photo coming up. Well, many in this province know about the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, its victories and the heartbreak during the four years of the First World War. But we don't often hear about what unfolded after those soldiers returned home. And to find out more about that side of the story, I met up with author and historian Frank Gogus at the Regiment Museum in St. John's. So many people know a lot about uh, the regiment during the First World War in Beaumont Hamill and its various successes on the battlefields of Europe. But let's talk about the regiment in the interwar period. So the boys come home. 1918, how are they welcomed? Well, they get a hero's welcome. 
uh, especially when the first contingent came back in February of 1919, which had Tommy Ricketts and some uh, prisoners of war. So you know, thousands came out to greet them. Right. By 1919, the regiment no longer existed except for a handful of clerical staff and Padre Thomas Nangle and his team, which were reburying Newfoundland's war dead right. uh, in France and Belgium and in Gallipoli as well. But given the, the attachment that Newfoundlanders had to the regiment uh, and the sacrifice, not just Beaumont Hamill, but throughout the war, why would this happen to such uh, an important military formation? Well, it was a very expensive uh, regiment to maintain for Newfoundland, so at the earliest opportunity, it was stood down. And generally, there was a sense that people were tired of the war and the death and destruction. And let's move on. And let's move on. What about the guys themselves? Because obviously, their uniforms, their identity, their their bonds of friendship and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. How did they take that? Do we know? Much like they do today, when a veteran now comes out of the Canadian Army, just like back then. And they leave and there's a sense of loss because they do lose that connection with their comrades and stuff like that. And that generally then leads to other issues, right. which we, we see it in, in today's military, right. veterans and PTSD and that sort of thing. Which we didn't really talk about a hundred years ago the, the way no. we do today, right? Absolutely. So these guys come home, I guess they try to get on with their lives in townies in St. John's, try and open businesses, get mm -hmm. to work, and other guys going back around the bay, maybe fishing. Yep. Take me to the 20s and 30s because obviously people didn't realize that a certain guy named Hitler was going to lead us back into another war in Europe. What happens that gets us to the 1940s? Leading up to World War II, there was some talk about reestablishing the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve because the Royal Navy um, felt very keenly towards Newfoundland sailors and that they were able to operate small vessels right. that could Seafaring board other people. Yeah. <laughs> When the war breaks out, the Commission of Government at that time actually stood up the Newfoundland Militia. Right. And by 1941, the militia is raised to full regiment status. W would that be the Royal Regiment again? Well, it was the Newfoundland Regiment. Okay. It wasn't designated Royal, largely for the same reasons why in the beginning in the First World War, the Newfoundland Regiment wasn't designated Royal in the beginning. Until the sacrifice. And until it was. Bravery. Yeah. yeah, until 1917 when the King finally decided that, mm -hmm. yes, we can give them. So does that mean that in the Second World War, um, there is no Royal Newfoundland Regiment? There is no, technically no Royal Newfoundland Regiment. There is a Newfoundland Regiment. All right. And uh, from our perspective, we do consider it a part of the regimental family and we're working hard to bring it officially into the fold. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because they became the recruiting uh, regiment for the two uh, artillery units that served in World War II in the Royal, in the Royal Artillery. Okay, so with the British. With the British. All right, so after the British, of course, there's Canada. Newfoundland joins Canada, or some people say Canada joins Newfoundland. Yeah. What happens then? I, I guess the, the, the unique Newfoundland military identity is, is folded into the Canadian military? When we joined Canada in 1949, one of the terms of union was the reestablishment of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. And that's how the current day regiment um, was formed. All right. It's interesting because sometimes I've been to some war zones and peacekeeping areas and I go there and half the soldiers seem to be from Newfoundland to this very day. Yeah. yeah. Major participation in, in that. Listen, I appreciate the history lesson, Frank. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate Thank that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I've never been there. No, I have never yeah. been there. I don't even know where it's located. Yeah, it's fantastic. Lots of stuff. So it's um, it's on the boulevard. We're close to Kitty Vitty Lake. You sort of just drive down, and it's in the Anthony Padden building. Mm -hmm. So lots of soldiers there as mm -hmm. well, so you got to go through. But you can actually get in there. Yeah, and it is open to the public. And uh, so it's Tuesday, Thursday, 6 to 9 p.m., and also on Saturday, 12 to 4. Right. So if your interest is piqued, by uh, what Anthony and uh, Mr. Gogus were talking about, you can go see for yourself. Check it out, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Lots of artifacts you see. Well, this viewer uh, photo, beautiful sunset oh. there. So many colors lately. Beautiful. I guess Gorgeous. all the time. <laughs> Any idea? Uh, is that a lake? Uh, yes. Oh. Are they birch? Uh, yes. Central. Two Birch Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Two Birch Lake, I like that one. I'll tell you where this photo was taken after the break. Gorgeous.
Okay, obviously it's not Two Birch Lake. Uh, beautiful shot though, so let her rip. It was from uh, the very uh, Burnt Berry Pond, no, <laughs> close to Springdale. That. Yeah, it was a, a beautiful shot there. Thank you so much, Harry Oxford, for sending that photo. So in. you know all about the movement of the sun and the earth and all that. So is that sunrise or sunset? Sunset. And how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is a test. I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> uh, Harry because actually, Harry said because on Harry his said note. it was in a sunset. That's right. Um, and he actually sent a nice uh, note there saying that he watched uh, North Beach when I was on that show. And Your now, former employer. Yeah, and now I'm here, so it's kind of nice when Good. people... Yeah. Oh, that's a nice connection yeah. for sure. Thank Every viewer you could bring us, we are grateful for, <laughs> Ashley. That's great. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's our show. Busy one for you. Yeah. It was busy. Than a speeding bullet. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, tomorrow I'll be at the rooms. Of course, you guys will be here. So tune in for our special Remembrance Day coverage heading into this weekend. We'll see you tomorrow. See you, everyone. Good night.